pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am to do another page 112 tag, my first of 2018. This is the tag that I guess I created based on a French literary prize for which the jurors select a short list by evaluating page 112 only of the books on the long list without any identifying information about title or author. So I've adapted that as a tag and it seems to be quite popular. There's a few different ways to do it, which I hope to remember to summarize at the end of the video. But today I'm doing just the regular page 112 tag. I have chosen three books off my shelf, which I have not yet read. Today I decided to group three recent works of translated fiction. Let's see how that goes. So I'm going to read you page 112. I'm going to give you my comments, my reactions. But most interesting for you should be your own reactions. And maybe you and I will disagree on which is the most interesting and least interesting of the batch. So let's get started. No, of living with him, God help me, but with everyone. Not that I want to be an example. I didn't come into the world to be a model. I have no originality whatsoever. But I'm not made of iron either. What I want is simply for the whole world to love me, even if this world is a little world of shit. This is my weakness. My soul expands or shrinks, fills up completely or empties itself, depending on how I am treated. If I am just given the time of day, I will almost burst from joy and goodwill. But if no one pays me attention, I teeter on the edge of annihilation. I only want to be seen and treated as a person among people, to live with them, to give and to receive, in an agreeable way. There can be a grain of suffering because that is a part of life, but it should be suffering that is necessary, not the futile anxieties of endless anguish, of bottomless depression. I must not fall into that again. Here I am in this flying contraption, burning to free myself forever from depression, tedium, self-loathing. But will I have the strength to do so? My God, I have to. Behind me is the old life already lived and wasted, worthless. I have no past because I don't want any part that was mine. But I have a future, that which I am going to create with my hands and my heart, beneath the light of God our Father. This faith that lives within me is now telling me that it is worth living the life of God's little creatures, like me, like him. Isais leans towards Elma to mention that the plane seems to be descending. They look out. Narrow eye must be that tiny red rectangle, remote, drawn on the savannah, with a small shed to one side. He had been expecting a small city. She, too. Elma controls the nausea provoked in her by the descent, and continues to brood. I had the courage to leave that world behind. Now I must have the courage to face this one. I am going to open that door, come what may. I know what lies behind me. It is a world of people devoid of souls who offer their bodies as compensation. As for me, that is over. No more extended arms, offered bodies, giving and begging. Now I'm going forward, with the nuns, or without them, in search of a new life. Okay, so what did you think of that? I thought that was interesting. I was confused, and it's obvious when you dive into a page 112 with no background information, it's usually confusing. So the point of viewing this tag is not to choose the excerpt that makes the most sense, but to choose the writing that is the liveliest, most interesting, that you're most curious about. So for this one, it, there's a lot of navel-gazing, and I was able to deduce by the end that it was the woman, Alma's, self-talk that we experienced at the beginning and then again at the end. She's in an, uh, an airplane with this guy, Isai's, and they're descending to a place called Narrow Time. She's religious, seems like she's joined a nunnery, which isn't usually the kind of story that I'm interested in, I have to be honest, but it sounds like she used to be a prostitute, so... Hmm. It's interesting. I didn't love the writing, but it was fine. It was just kind of workmanlike. All of the religious kind of navel-gazing, this is the first day of the rest of my life stuff, 
was quite mitigated by the phrase, even if this world is a little world of shit. That kind of took away a lot of the cringing about the religious talk, which I just, I just don't like. Mm, yeah, I'd say kind of so-so. I'm interested. I want to know where did they come from? Where are they going? What is their relationship? Next, book number two. Now, I will also tell you that for the next two books, page 112 was very short, less than half a page. So I have elected to read page 111 because it's my tag. I can do what I want. There's no right or wrong way to do this tag. Uh, sometimes I start with a sentence that begins at the bottom of page 111, if that gives more context, or finish a sentence onto page 113. So just, it's very flexible. But these are page 111, these next two. The houses of living people, on the other hand, had a front door with a number that arranged them in order among all the other houses for the living, but they did not give the name of the bodies that were on the far side of the door. The tourists left soft toys they bought in the Graceland souvenir shops on Elvis's headstone. Fidel lowered his head, and his face took on a serious expression. He asked if he could tell her something quickly. He said he was called Elvis after one of his uncles. Oh, is that so? Laura said, believing for a moment that a door into the boy's past had been left open. No, it's a lie, Fidel said, and what if he had carried on with the lie, and then she had asked him what was on the first floor of Elvis's house, and he would not have known what to say. Laura saw this might be the moment to ask Fidel something about his life, about relatives or songs, but she also realized that in fact she did not want to know anything about him that was not her. They played games together. They tried to guess what time it was. They made a bet and then dialed 117 to find out the truth. They had the game of Ludo he had brought from the center, and a Christmas crib she kept stored. Okay, wow. That's a short little page. It's a full page, but it's a short little page, and very curious. The writing, again, is very plain, but I, I quite like the writing. And I have so many questions. So what are houses of living people that didn't give the name of the bodies on the far side of the door? What the heck? And are they at... Uh, uh, where is Graceland? Somewhere in the, in the Deep South, wherever Elvis's Graceland is. But then, so they are in the cemetery where Elvis is buried? Fidel says, he said he was called Elvis after one of his uncles. Does he mean that Elvis Presley was named after one of Elvis Presley's uncles? It, Or is... Uh, yeah, I... I, I... And what Laura and Fidel, what is their relationship? It seems like she doesn't know anything about him, but she doesn't want to know anything about him that was not hers playing the games together, guessing what time it was. That's interesting. Made a bet and then dialed 117 to find out the truth. So that must be, this is obviously in a different country. So do a bet and then find, I don't understand that. that, that so I'm curious about that. I don't know what the game of Ludo is. This is very curious. I am very intrigued by this. And the last one, also page 111. And this is in the middle of a paragraph that begins at the beginning of the chapter, three pages before, and ends at the end of the chapter on the next page. So <laughs> this is a chapter-long paragraph, and you're going to hear the page 111 chunk of it. Actually, I'm going to start at the bottom of page 110. When the man asked her what she was doing near the cave, she said she'd gone to Meraldina to visit the cemetery where her mother was buried. She went there often, and when she came back, she always took the long route to see if she could get a glimpse of the man from the cave. She was also looking for her daughter, whom she hadn't seen all day. The boys who killed the old man entered the village before her. When she reached it, they were explaining how they'd slain the old man, displaying the cudgel, which was still wet with blood, beating their chests with delight. Everything began with the fire. People were terrified about the shadows the watchmen had seen. A group of men had cornered the man from up the mountain, the one who had tried to strangle the cement man, and he'd bolted into a house, propped the door shut, and was running along the roof to see if he could jump from one to another and escape. But they followed him. He told them it wasn't his fault. He'd been blind with rage. The ones on the street called to him to come down. We won't hurt you. Come down. The man kept shouting that he wasn't to blame. It was in his blood while the others continued calling to him to come down. Many hours later, the man gave up and came down from the roof. They cracked open his skull, but he wasn't dead, so they strung him up by his feet 
from a tree in the placa. Like a horse, they said, when they left him there. And before returning to the fighting arena, they gave him a shove so he'd swing back and forth. That was when, while the man and my wife, yes, that was when the blacksmith's son, yanked me by the arm and led me away. I still don't know. It all happened so fast. Time has muddled everything. When we left the village, we came across Senor's stretcher, abandoned in the open, and the blacksmith's son told me to move fast. A cloud of smoke was pouring out of the stables, followed immediately by flames. And as the flames battled the smoke and wind, the sound of galloping horses reached us. They sped past, almost brushing against us, knocking over the stretcher and Senor, treading on them. The earth shook, and I covered my ears. When the horses had passed, the blacksmith's son pulled me along, and, without knowing how, we found ourselves at Pedre Bakes's. Night was ending, and the smell of fire pervaded everything. Okay, well, that was very dramatic and kind of gory. Kind of a dream-like quality to the prose. I wasn't sure if it was all happening. I guess it was, but the, the prose has definitely kind of a surreal quality. The uh, narrator is confused and perhaps overwhelmed. I like the writing quite a bit. There's nothing about the writing I don't like. The story itself, I'm not sure, is my kind. But who knows if it's just one kind of gory page out of it. the only one in the book. I'm interested in this old man that was murdered what he meant when he said it was in his blood, he'd been blind with rage. And then the man and my wife, and then the blacksmith's son. Is the man and the blacksmith's son two different people? It seems so. So it's like he starts this, this thought, while the man and my wife, yes, that was when the blacksmith's son yanked me by the arm. So there's a, the man and the narrator's wife over here, and the blacksmith's son yanking me over there. That's curious. And... What is this senor's stretcher? So, lots of questions about this. So, this is very interesting. I didn't really notice it until I've just kind of gone back to review what I read. It seems like it's third-person narration at the beginning and then flips into first-person, but it could all just be first-person narration, but we don't get anything about the narrator until near the end. But it's when he says, that was while the man and my wife... I think that's the first indication of any first-person narrator and up until then it's been her and they and she and he so that's curious and then it's really focused on that first-person narrator to the bottom of the page so okay so I think my decision is fairly easy and I guess I would say that out of these particular three choices really none of them grab me in a deep way so my first pick is book number two and that is about the woman and the boy at Elvis's headstone. This one, I'm very curious about the relationship between those two, and it seems like kind of a the kind of story that grabs me. So, yeah, that's definitely my first choice. I guess my f second choice, they're kind of even, but my second choice would be book number three, that violent scene with the man getting his head bashed in and tied up like a horse and... Not sure it's for me, but the writing is interesting, and it's certainly there are a lot of interesting questions. But it doesn't seem like it's going to be my kind of story, to be honest. And pretty much tied for it, but I will choose this as number three, is book number one. And this is about the man and woman in the airplane touching down at Narotai. So, yeah, I'm interested in that one too. A little put off by the religious stuff, but I like the fact that she was a prostitute, so that balances it out. So those are my choices. I expect your choices might be very different, and I'll be very curious to hear what they are. So, now's the part where I get to tell you what these books are. Book number one, which was my third choice, is called Maíra by Darcy Hebeiru. This is a Brazilian novel, which I picked up used in Tokyo for like $2 a couple years ago. Darcy Hebeiru was born in Brazil in 1922, a distinguished anthropologist and also cabinet minister, politician in Brazil, and novelist. This is about a young Amazon Indian 
Aces. He converts to Christianity, but then he thinks better of it and he renounces the seminary and goes back to his indigenous tribe, which is called the Meirun, to become their chief. The Alma, who we met on page 112, is a young white woman undergoing a spiritual crisis and joins a group of nuns to work among that tribe. So that's the story. The original is 1978 and this translation 1984. This is a, it's a nice cover and a, one of those paperbacks that's really heavy. It just feels lovely in your hand. It's, it's the kind of thing that I love. And yeah, I will probably try it, but it will probably be the third of the ones that I try. So that was book number one. Book number two is also a book I bought mostly because of its cover. It's called The Children by Carolina Sanin. And I just love that cover. And this is from Colombia, translated from the Spanish in 2017, originally published in 2014. I think I talked about this on a 10 books tag once. So it's about this woman, Laura, who, when she goes to the local supermarket, encounters a homeless person who gives her a child. So that must be Fidel. And he's six years old. This will be the one that I try first. And it's a short little one. 150 pages. And book number three, which was my second choice. Another gorgeous cover. Death in Spring by Merce Rotoreda. A Catalan novel. Apparently, Merce Rotoreda was the preeminent Catalan novelist of her day. She died in 1983, loved by, among others, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I'll just read this. The novel tells the story of the bizarre and destructive customs of a nameless town through the eyes of a 14-year-old boy. The boy struggles to come to terms with the rhyme and reason of the town's ritual violence and with his wild, teenaged stepmother becomes his playmate. Anyway, this one seems kind of weird, but I, I love the cover. Which one would you choose? I've made my choices uh, obvious, but how about you? Like I say, none of them grab me in a deep way, but this one definitely does sound like my kind of story. And that was my first pick, The Children by Carolina Sanin, a Colombian novel. Second pick was Death in Spring by Merce Rodorita, a Catalan novel, and Maíra by Darcy Hebeiru, a Brazilian novel. How about you? I'll be very curious to see if you've read any of these books, if any of them are interesting, what would have been your ranking. And also, just to quickly conclude, if you're interested in doing this tag, it's an open tag. Anybody can do it at any time. There's several variations. This is the variation that I originally created. Just pull three books off your Kindle or your shelf for, or from your library and do the page 112 tag, reveal the titles and authors at the end. Other people, notably Simon Savage, but several others have also done it where they reveal the titles and authors at the very beginning. They don't keep it a surprise from the viewer. And that's a very useful that's a very legitimate way to do it because this method for ascertaining which book you might like to read, you start with the book on the shelf in the library or in the bookstore, and you can't decide between the three of them, so you always know the title and author. So it's just as good a way to do it as the way that I've just done it. And the third way, which I've just done once or twice, is a totally blind version of this tag where one of my subscribers or another booktuber emails me three page 112s and I read them and evaluate them where I don't know the titles and authors until the very end of the video when I open my, the email which reveals the titles and authors to me. And that's a fun way to do it too. So if you're interested in doing any of those, if you're interested in sending me some blind page 112s, anything like that, please leave a comment below. In the meantime, thanks for watching.